We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Our next speaker is Matthias Gunther, a Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario. And the work he's going to maybe be focusing on today, in addition to much of other work he's done, is exploring the meaning and function and routes to identity that folk tales, uh, especially animal folk tales, play in uh, gather hunter societies and how that may relate to conceptions of human origins and identity. Thank you. Thank you. I will be talking about uh, both storytelling, especially around the fireside, and about the Kalahari San people, as well as uh, another group, uh, the Come of, uh, North, of South, Southern Africa, the Cape, who have now disappeared, but who left an, a very, very rich treasure trove of myths and tales that were collected in the 1870s from the Krum uh, people by Wilhelm Blake and um, Lucy Lloyd. Now, a good number of these tales that are told around the fire uh, side would, would be about animals. Either recently encountered animals out in the felt or about animals from myth time, which the sun referred to as the first order of existence. This was a time of flux, our beginnings and becomings, when beings and states were incurred, were not fully formed. It, the pre predominant inhabitants of that time were the uh, so-called early race, who were themselves ambiguous in their makeup, as we will see. They were not quite human, not quite animal, and the second most prominent uh, figure in this myth, and uh, the most important denizen of the first order of existence was the trickster, um, who is himself shot through with ambiguity and, uh, and indeterminacy and inquitness. Now, animals, uh, of course, are also uh, very prominent in the lives and thoughts and imaginations of people today in what uh, the San referred to as the second order of existence, which succeeded the first order in, in um, San mythology and cosmology. And these two, two orders of existence still overlap today. Um, and as hunting people and gathering people, who roam their territories over last di di distances, um, many animals are encountered. And it is usually the animal encounters that uh, give rise to stories. Animals are excellent story materials. They're not only bons à manger or à, uh, à, à penser, but also à fabuler, à, to fabulate about and tell stories about. And this is what I want to talk about. Um, I, I quote uh, the Akoi storyteller Satao who says, 
A hunter is always a storyteller. Hunting is part of storytelling. When I get home enjoying the meal, I tell the story of the hunt, of what happened. Now, told and retold by different individuals at different places and different times over generations, stories about hunts and animals become taller and taller as they enter a fact to fiction trajectory from tall tale to memorate and legend to myth. And back again, as the story retold as myth, is referenced in its telling back to reality, to specific people and sites, tasks and events in the landscape. A story thereby becomes all the more notable and memorable through the symbolic, creative back and forth between myth and reality via the imagination and experience, much of it mediated through storytelling. Mythology, mythology and storytelling thereby become integral components of cosmology and worldview. A good entry into San mythology is through the culture's rock art. As these two branches of San expressive culture are linked conceptually through sh shared, a shared theme in San cosmology, which I'm talking about today, a good term for this theme, recently coined by the French poet and rock art researcher, um, Renaud Ego is humanimalité, human, humani, I always stumble over this, um, hum, huma, humanimality, <laughs> human animality. Um, it, this is the ontological state, the being state of the early race. Mythologists call to refer to these beings that blend human and animal traits as therianthropes. Now, this is particularly striking in rock art imagery. Um, it's a motif that is found in all rock sites in Southern Africa, along with depictions of actual animals and humans. Here's just a random sampling of many of these images. Therianthropic figures combine features from a diversity of animal species with final components from such animals as baboons, elephants, lions, wildebeest, hippopotamus, and so on and so on. They are, can also appear as uh, human-animal hybrids, which mythologists call um, chimeras. They are also found. Now, this one uh, is 27,000 years old, approximately, from southwestern Namibia, um, uh, a therianthropic peak figure, and it is also um, found in contemporary Bushman art. This one, uh, the uh, Komani artist, um, the late uh, Rechop of Stan Kruiper. It's, it's very, uh, very earthy, as you can see, very um, uh, blending scatological and erotic things, which uh, pre- I'll get to that later, because that's very much a part of the trickster, who is also the uber, the hyper uh, therianthrope and shapeshifter. OK, the, this, I, I have particular interest in this figure, because it's I actually put, put it on the cover of my book. But that's not actually why I'm showing it, to plug the book. Uh, it, is, it displays this human-animal condition in such a subtle way, because you don't know, is this figure becoming an antelope from a human, or is it the other way around? And is this actually a constitutional uh, therianthrope? That is, is it such in its being, or is it a transitional one, metamorphosing into one or the other? When you look at um, these images, and also at Bushman myth, this, what I've just shown you in the images, this indeterminacy of these figures, which is it? Uh, is it animal, is it human, is it both, is it neither? Is a theme that these stories uh, dwell on and play with. Um, and uh, they do so in very nuanced and subtle ways. Um, and uh, they feature many, many animal beings. 
Uh, here is a, an A to Z list from Sigurd Schmitz. She's a folklorist who has studied uh, uh, Khoisan mythology along uh, this Thompson lines. Uh, um, and this is 106 animals exactly from A to uh, Aardvark to Zebra, who all appear in the myth in some form or other, blended with humans. And uh, stories always introduce the beginning, the stereotypical beginning of a story is that this story is about an elephant, and the elephant, elephants were humans back then, were persons. But they weren't really persons, they were yes and no persons. They were, uh, for example, the mantis, which is the most highly profiled uh, Bushman trickster figure, most described and from come mythology. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stories about Mantis or Kagan, the, the trickster. But uh, when, you, when the storytellers were asked, now what, what is it? Is it, is the Mantis uh, an insect? Yes, yes, the storytellers say, yes, he's a green little thing with, that spreads wings when taking flight. But it's not a Mantis insect, the storyteller insists. But it is also not not a mantis, <laughs> because it's both a mantis and a person. It's a mantis man. Mantis, even more complicated, because with an apostrophe, you don't know, is he actually mantis, or is he a creature of mantis? So this indeterminacy is, is, all, all is, is what makes these animal stories so interesting, because they allow you to, as a listener, to identify with the animals, because the animals aren't quite that, yet they're also not human. They are beings that merge identities of these two beings that we, in the Cartesian uh, Western um, worldview, uh, see as divided. They, they were, however, also people in, in other ways. They, they fought. They had in-law tensions. They also exchanged stories and, and goods and family uh, relations and marriage relations were all very much the way that uh, Polly Wisner described to us. Uh, but also not quite, uh, because there was a lot of um, liability. These social institutions were labile, they were nascent, they were forever transgressed, they were ever um, uh, um, violated in, in, in serious ways. For example, people would, these early race people would eat each other, they would hunt each other, they would, um, the, the most widespread uh, story is about, um, that's found in all of these dozens of linguistic groups, is about um, early race man, so a jackal, who is married a kocha, a, a woman, and uh, he brings her home to his band, and his people eventually convince him that this is not a person, you have married meat. You have married meat. And he is eventually convinced, the young man is, and then the story sh takes its terrible, uh, predictable conclusion. They kill her, they eat her. Oftentimes there's a chase story uh, where she tries to get away and usually doesn't. So we have ontological indeterminacy amongst these early race people and social Ability, social fragility. And the trickster figure builds on these, on these two traits. The trickster himself is, uh, the, 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 the 19th century Kon, a trickster from northern Namibia and Botswana, his name was Khur. He, um, Khur, here's a, one of the storytellers 
actually do a car cartoon in, 18, in the 1880s of the story where we see Hue in a fight with his wife. Uh, and he undergoes um, transformation into an elephant, wh whereas, while his wife, in a state of agitation, undergoes transformation into two different species of tree. And then the story is annotated. In another story, um, he undergoes as many as 17 transformations in one of his spats with his spouse as he chases her and goes, undergoes all of these different transformations into all, uh, any conceivable creature from covering all the phyla, including in one story, it becomes a teardrop. <laughs> um, so the, I would like to link, bring this to, to reality. There, there's one important point I want to make about all of this. I would like to move from the early race humans and the early race trickster who also appears in the present second order in many ways. For one thing, he appears as God because the, the Bushman trickster, like, not unique in this way, other tricksters are like that, is also a divinity, which is something that the missionaries had trouble with. <laughs> in fact, uh, to this day, the official entry in the narrow, Bush, narrow English dictionary of uh, Grandma, the trickster, is devil, Satan. Um, but anyway, the, there is resonance in a number of ways um, be, between these stories of therianthropes, of human animals, um, with humans and animals today. It's a case, I've developed this in my book, this idea of where myth and reality and cosmology come together, blend, each reinforcing the other, creating a kind of hermeneutic circle that, through which <coughs> mythology is reinforced through experience, and experience is, is valorized through myth. Myths that, as we heard before from Pauli's talk, are people tell each other with um, great animation around the fireside, especially at night. And the, there are three situations, there are actually more, but the three situations that I quickly wanted to, to, to deal with it were, were this meeting of human and animal, this merging of identities, this merging of um, alterity and uh, similarity um, becomes evident. And one, <laughs> one is in the trance dance, the trance dance is the important ritual. It's a curing dance in which a shaman um, undergoes lion transformation and experiences bodily. He feels teeth growing, for example. Um, he feels neck hair uh, bristling. So he undergoes lion transformation. The other is the, the uh, initiate, the young woman undergoing her monarchal rite and the young man be go undergoing the hunter, hunter's initiation, where they identify in a very close, visionary and emotionally intense experience, much of it brought on through dancing, where they, where they in enact the courtship behavior of the eland antelope, where they uh, identify with, with the animal. And then the third one is the one that really interests me, is the hunter who in certain moments at the hunt, not all hunts, in particular the pers persistence hunt, where, where they chase down the animal on foot and then exhaust, exhaust it, the, the hunt ends and the two, the exhausted prey, the exhausted uh, hunter face each other. And uh, when the uh, hunter sees him himself reflected really in the eyes of the quarry before he, kills it, and in this situation, there's a, an intense bond between hunt, human and animal, hunter-prey, 
which the accomplishment uh, referred to as tappings. Tappings are sensations in the body, different parts of the body that correspond to the parts in the animal's body. So that the, the, for a fleeting moment, the hunter and animal merge identities. And I see this as a situation in real life, along with trans dancing and the monarchical uh, right of human and animal blending identities of experience real, um, reiterating uh, in, through bodily, often somatically, myth. I uh, see my time is up. I was going to relate all of this to anthropogeny. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, the Bushmen are often used as, in ethnographic analogy by archaeologists to, to fill out the gaps that archaeological sites leave, right? Because you don't know anything about spirituality and myth telling uh, from the archaeological record. So these connections that I've just made between mythology and hunting and experience, uh, phenomenology, may be relevant to the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, the connection being the two bodies of art. You know, the, the art is b very similar, I cannot, I, both in terms of content and style. And the, of course, there's a connection between art and myth. And this, having been unraveled, sort of, amongst contemporary Bushmen, might provide us a key to understanding Paleolithic, rock art and mythology and cosmology. Thank you. <laughs>